Um, probably time to get started since we have a, a faculty meeting at 3.30, so hopefully I planned this so that we'll be done well in time for that. Um, I, think, I think Bailey might be at a conference and she's organizing this, so maybe I'll just briefly introduce myself, which is, uh, let's see, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and was interested in wind gusts and snow. Um, I worked with Yost Boosing on the boundary layer at, at, in Seattle for a while, but then switched to working with Conway Leovi on planetary wave dynamics in the stratosphere. Um, since then, I've worked at NCAR with Heber Suren building a, a model of uh, forecasting ozone for 100 years in the stratosphere. And then in, in Madison, I've, I've um, had a period of time where I was lucky enough to participate in aircraft, aircraft flight campaigns with NASA and started to focus a little bit more on the tropopause level, which is um, the topic of, of this talk. So, um, but if you want numbers, I guess I got here in 1988. So started on the faculty. Uh, this is a, a talk that's based on this paper that we just published, and uh, it was released on August 8th, but I don't know if you've had this challenge. I thought I'd throw this out. Just um, uh, AMS journals are, are now using a, a, a third party for, for the final layout. And the, the first layout had all of the figures running way to the end through the text. And it was like four or five pages offset. So then sent it back and said, you know, put the figures together with the text. And now it's the opposite. The figures are all well before the text. Is <laughs> so I don't, I, I sent back to the editor, whatever is your policy is OK. But I don't know if you've had that kind of challenge with that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Just this paper, because there's too many figures in it. <laughs> <clears throat> OK, so this talk is about uh, the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere. So think of the tropopause within a few kilometers up and down from that. That's the UTLS. Um, it focuses on these odd things that actually Shelley wrote on for her master's degree work in Greg Tripoli's model. And at first, we were going like, what are these things? But they've proven to be quite interesting. They tie in with other uh, theoretical aspects. Um, Hmm. This uh, this figure caption and figure are, are not visible, so it's changed the aspect ratio. So I can't see my full figures. Um, what should I do? With Good question. Yeah. What does it look like on your? It's the same on, on here. I think you can change that to have it run by. You're on 16.9. It is showing the whole thing on here. Yeah. And it, and it moved this too. Mm -hmm. That looks right. I yeah. guess if we're yeah. not showing it on here, then it's okay. So I guess you have to suffer through okay. using the okay. uh, presenter uh, mode. Hmm. So if I put it in the mode where it looks like that on my computer, then it just is the aspect ratio and it affects these as well. Apparently. Okay. Um, so what? What we're going to showcase here are, are three simulations of three tropical cyclones uh, with Great Tripoli's UW NMS model. It's a non hydrostatic model. Um, and these are of Talos and Edward in the northern hemisphere and tropical cyclone Eta in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and what we found is that these PV dipoles, just to explain what we're talking about up front, these PV dipoles are generally confined to the upper troposphere, lower stratosphere. And the jetlets, here's an example of a jetlet, actually opposes the ambient anticyclonic flow. So in this particular case, this is Talus, the low pressure center is here. This, this huge convective complex is landfalling in Japan on the Kia Peninsula, causing a lot of rain and landslides. Well, you know in the northern hemisphere that in the upper portion of the hurricane, the flow is around this way. It's anticyclonic. This flow is the opposite direction in this little jetlet. And what we take from that basic thing is that this air here has come up from below. It's cyclonic flow at mid-levels that's been transported rapidly upward in an updraft, and it's in the opposite direction to the, the direction of the flow that you'd expect for a hurricane. They form about 100 to 250 kilometers from the eye, and we call these just convective asymmetries in general. And they're characterized by really interesting signatures. Surges of air, they accelerate in the boundary layer, accelerate further in the updraft, they overshoot and then extend radially outward 
and often join with the um, subtropical westerly jet. So there are, these things are three-dimensional conduits for chemicals and momentum transport right into the stratosphere. Um, in order to kind of have an overarching theme, I thought I'd put this question out there. What do you think? Is the horizontal wind speed of air in a thunderstorm faster or slower than it's in an environment? You know, usually I think of, well, there's a, a thermal, and, <coughs> and the air at the bottom of the thunderstorm isn't moving very quickly horizontally, and it's going up into air that's moving faster, which might, you know, grab onto it and shear it over. There'll be drag on it and maybe accelerate it, but, but the updraft itself is probably slowing the flow down by that interaction. That's just what I've always thought. <laughs> it's extraordinary. In hurricanes, it's the opposite. And when I finally understood that, then things started to fall into place. So uh, the three primary themes are, um, first of all, to just describe this unique three-dimensional morphology of the flow through the U-tail-S PV dipole jetlets. If you see a PV dipole jetlet, it means a, a particular interesting signature in three dimensions involving the boundary layer, the updraft, and the outflow jet. Um, the second main theme is we have a different, a new way of looking at this in terms of in convective momentum transport. This is our hypothesis for their origin. And I'd like to draw your attention to this figure. So here's somebody who's taken a paddle and went that way in the water. Um, and, and what you have then is a jetlet in between two counter-rotating vortices. If you have a jet, you have a dipole and vorticity. Um, so if you turn that upside down, I'm hoping that you'll accept this as a an analogy and that um, an updraft that's moving at a different speed than the lowest stratosphere will kind of scrape the stratosphere and excite two counter rotating vortices. So, um, spend some time on that. <clears throat> Another thing that we realized is that because the winds are actually higher in the convective complex, the horizontal speed of the wind is higher within these complexes than outside, this raises the interesting possibility that acceleration in convective complexes. The sum total of those may be tropical cyclone amplification, and there's an emerging body of theory in the last five years, and maybe 15 papers, that are sort of hinting along these lines, which is to say the classical axisymmetric theories are maybe overlooking this aspect that acceleration actually occurs in clumps of thunderstorms. Um, so this is this fourth paper, the kind of in line with this progressive thought, where we first start to look at inertial instability in the UTLS and then realize these PV dipoles were, were important. Um, this one, we'll save for a talk, it's, we're, we're revising it. It just asks for uh, moderate revision, so I'm hopeful of publishing this one pretty soon, and we'll give a talk on that later. It applies uh, the same concepts in this that I'll show you here um, with some success to the case of the thunderstorms that were involved in um, the severe flooding event of last October, August 20th. The, I won't have time to talk about that today. All right, so here's an outline. I um, put these three in italics because these are sort of three different ways of looking at this problem from a theoretical point of view. The first is the classical vortex tilting hypothesis for PV dipole jetlet formation. And the second one is uh, what I think is more intuitive and simpler, more straightforward, convective momentum transport hypothesis. And I'll show you that they're, they're actually the same. It's just a slightly different point of view. Then, uh, so I'm actually presenting results of all our thought processes after considering these, these cases. Well, so I'll tell you what those are, and it'll, it'll be easier for us to understand the cases, kind of reversing the order in which this actually happened. Um, we studied these first and then realized that this is true. Um, we'll apply it to ETA and test our dynamical theories to see if we can apply this successfully to the southern hemisphere as well. And then this third perspective is, you know, some people think that um, Airtel's potential vorticity really needs to be treated in three dimensions and very, very carefully, and that it's not okay to talk about the vertical component of absolute vorticity only. So, uh, toward that end, um, we'll examine this canoe paddle, or a, a moving updraft relative to the stratosphere causing a, like a stroke on the stratosphere, creating a, a spatially isolated stress, which then, um, in potential vorticity thinking, in, in the conservation equation, what you have on the right-hand side for source terms for changing PV following the motion are two different types of processes. One, if you can 
hit the flywheel on the side by uh, as the removal stresses, you can spin up PV. Or if you have a vertical distribution of heating that causes stretching, you can spin up PV. Those are the only two ways. Hmm. Actually, there are multiple ways, right? It's not just the vertical distribution, but a horizontal distribution of heating with your vortex vector tilted. True, true. So, yes, and so when we get to this, um, I'll show you that equation, and it does have uh, several terms, and we'll, we'll do an analysis of magnitude of this tangential uh, stress term, and find, we'll find that it, it can create potential vorticity on um, about one PV unit per minute at that rate, whereas the other terms involving latent heating and diabatic heating and gradients of them, also in, in horizontally and vertically, that's true, both directions, um, those terms seem to be more on the order of magnitude of one PV unit per day. Uh, so we'll, we'll get to that. So first, the classical theory of how these things could arise. The earliest um, mention that I found in the literature is by Davies Jones. It's a pretty neat paper from 1984. And you can see that if you have uh, flow in this direction, that there'll be the vorticity associated with that if you have zero speed at the ground. And this vorticity is directed this way. So here's some horizontal vortex lines that are directed toward the left of the wind. And now, you imagine an updraft or a mountain, this is a theta surface, and if you take one of these horizontally oriented tubes and tip it up, it will have positive vorticity on this side of the mountain and negative vorticity on the far side of the mountain, thus creating a pair of counter-rotating vortices. Uh, this is a common, a robust theme in Markowski and Richardson's textbook about tornado genesis, theories there of tornado genesis. A uh, more recent um, paper on this is by Shannon and Gray in 2009, <coughs> and they looked at a kind of a simplified potential vorticity conservation equation using the Boussinesque form for the vertical motion, which allows for density perturbations. And they studied the, these two processes together. <coughs> so FD by DZ of B, B is the uh, rate of heating, which is related to W, where, where latent heating maximizes in the mid troposphere, that's where you expect maximum upward motion. That term will generate vortex stretching in the lower troposphere below the maximum and vortex compression above. Hmm. Um, the second term is a tilting twisting term. If you think of D as proportional to vertical motion and, and big lambda is dBdz, that's a dBdz times dW2x term. This, this is a classic tilting twisting term in, in Holton's conservation equation for absolute vorticity. So, it's the second process that's being shown here. These vectors indicate mid-level shear, which is that direction. Um, and we have an updraft in yellow, and the horizontal vorticity is coming to the board. And so an updraft will tilt that upward, and that's this red patch, and then downward on the other side in a horseshoe shape, that's the blue patch, and that's negative PV. This extends uh, throughout the depth of the troposphere in their example. The ones that we've been studying are concentrated in the UTLS, which requires further explanation. This particular uh, conceptual model applies very nicely to the, um, the situation that occurred last summer with the extreme rainfall. But that's for a future talk. All right, so um, I guess I've already mentioned this, that the Shannon and Gray's term here is is analogous to Holton's tilt and twisting term here, dwx and dz. So let's just apply this idea to um, a situation in the mid latitudes. This is north. So let's say d, the northward flow is increasing in height. That means then we have uh, horizontal vorticity zeta 1 in the negative x direction, pointed in the negative x direction. Huh. Well, let's introduce an updraft and twist this vortex tube upward so that the vertical component is positive and downward on this side so that the vertical component is negative. That creates a PV dipole. And if you notice, if the wind shear direction is northward, then the negative member lies to the left of the wind shear. So we looked at a lot of mid-latitude cyclones and a lot of tropical cyclones and found that that general rule was true. Um, as a related concept, when you produce um, a PV dipole on the scale of about 100 to 200 kilometers horizontal scale, um, the Rossby number associated with that with the is of order two. And, and so it's not particularly balanced flow. Um, and uh, the negative member is generally larger than minus F. 
which makes it inertial unstable. So here's the classic equation for inertial instability, a spring equation, meridional displacement delta s. If this quantity is negative, then there can be acceleration. And you will we'll have the, the full formula for PV and its conservation later in section six, but you can tell that part of PV, which is F plus theta, and then one over OD theta dz, is absolute vorticity. So if you want to look for inertial instability, a signature is negative PV, or absolute vorticity negative in the northern hemisphere. Um, and if you find such a region, it implies polar acceleration, enhanced divergence, probably enhanced pre precipitation, and also gravity wave excitation. And then just briefly on that point, just one slide, here's a, uh, a now classic paper in 2007 by Snyder now showing radiation of gravity waves from a, a, a balanced dipole. Well, it's not quite in balance because it's adjusting. So there's a jetlet here. This jetlet might be changing in time, which requires, from theory, radiation of gravity waves. And if you take a slice through this, you can see in this section, amplified over here, these um, tilted gravity waves that are transporting momentum and adjusting the flow. So that's an expected signature of PV dipoles also. And indeed, they are active centers of gravity wave excitation. And the updraft associated with it is continuous with the gravity wave updraft portion of the field into the stratosphere. Now let's try to apply this uh, to the geometry of a tropical cyclone. And we'll pick the northern hemisphere. And notice that these are different. Z is the same, but R is radially outward. And theta is azimuthal. So we're going, the low pressure center is way over there. Here's mid-tropospheric cyclonic flow. But in the uppermost troposphere, we know the flow reverses to anticyclonic, the outflow there. So this, this shear is this way. And that means that the horizontal vorticity is pointed radially outward. And theta r is positive, pointed radially outward. Well, what happens if an updraft pushes into one of these vortex tubes that are oriented radially outward? It'll push, point this one vertically, and so you'll have positive on the left. And this one will be pointed down, so you'll have negative on the right. And because you have a, a pair of counter-rotating vortices, you have to have a jetlet in between. So this is the, the point of view of starting with um, vorticity, and then arguing that you have to have a jetlet. The second point of view says you create a jetlet, therefore you will have these counter-rotating vortices. So here's the, well, first of all, just to complete this discussion of how jetlets and dipoles are oriented in a tropical cyclone, based purely on the updraft tilting hypothesis, um, in this one we have upper tropospheric shears are um, anticyclonic, and that means that vorticity is pointed radially outward. And so an updraft right here will tilt this vorticity to point upward on the inside and downward on the outside with a jetlet resulting in between that's in the opposite direction to the shear. And the negative center is radially outward, and it's to the left of the shear. And one thing that you can then, so I only drew a couple of them just to suggest that what if you have some convection here and some convection here? This is probably convection over here too. I'm just showing a few examples. Um, but the fact that each convective complex tends to push inertially and stable air outward on the out, radially outward side of the outflow region, um, those things add up to a larger scale outflow, which Greg Tripoli has, has been studying, you know, how do hurricanes interact with the broader environment. So in the southern hemisphere with this theory, the upper tropospheric shear is again anticyclonic, which means clockwise in the southern hemisphere. And so that means that the horizontal vorticity is pointed radially inward. And if you have an updraft, then it'll tilt that inward vorticity upward, and the positive PV will be on the outside. The downward or negative PV anomaly will be on the inside. <coughs> you might think, oh, is southern hemisphere dynamics, dynamics radically different? No, the positive member in the, in the southern hemisphere is inertially unstable. So inertially unstable members are created radially outward from these convective processes. Well, that's the classical point of view. Um, here's the convective momentum transport hypothesis, and I think it has some merit to consider. Here's uh, Malchus's classical uh, study of um, thunderstorm updrafts in shear, or fair weather cumulus in shear. Um, they start off with low horizontal wind speed and rise up and 
they get bent over by the flow. They're moving slower than the flow. This is actually commonly the case in mid-latitudes. So if you think of, well, here's increasing meridional flow. So let's, this is the northward direction. And around here, in, in an approaching uh, trough with warm up glide sector, usually there's really deep flow that extends well into the stratosphere, just monotonic shear, increasing with height into the lower stratosphere. Well, if you just think of parcel displacement there, you take a parcel of air and put it in an updraft, it's going to move slower than its environment. It'll have U prime negative, right, from sort of mixing length theory. So that's sketched here. This, is, this would be what you'd get locally relative to the environment if you just pushed the parcel of air upward that's moving more slowly. So now this is x, y. That means this jetlet is directed southward here, which means that you'll have to have this counter-rotating pair of vortices. All right, well, that actually is the case in mid-latitudes. Mid um, this jetlet, which is directed southward, closes <laughs> the basic flow, which is northward. And this is observed repeatedly in mid-latitudes, so that's kind of the normal state of affairs, or so I thought. But in tropical cyclones, there's a really different environment up here. This, the, the wind speeds don't keep increasing. There's a big maximum in the mid-troposphere for the northward flow, say, to the east of a low pressure center in a northern hemisphere tropical cyclone. And there's a rapid shear toward easterly flow a lot. That means it's different than this situation. If you take air in, a, in an updraft that's moving pretty quickly and push it into the UTLS, it's going to be moving in a cyclonic sense. Whereas the entire rest of the air at that level is going to be moving in an anticyclonic sense. Huh. All right, so that's northward. This is northward. The jetlet is in the same sense as the mid-tropospheric flow. Therefore, you have these vortices, and the negative member lies radially outward. Hmm. So that agrees with the classical theory of vortex tilting. Here's an example of how you sort out, how you can predict, predict the orientation of the jetlets and the dipoles. In the northern hemisphere, if this green arrow is, it's less complicated, it's simply the flow at mid-levels. It's not shear, it's a little bit easier. This is the flow at mid-levels. Cyclonic. You push it up in an updraft, it's going to be cyclonic. That's the sense of this little jetlet. Because you have a jetlet, that means you have these. So this is, the jetlet is invoked at first, and therefore you have the dipole. In the southern hemisphere, mid-level <coughs> cyclonic flow is this way, and if you push it up in an updraft, it'll be like that. Therefore, you have to have a PV dipole with the inertial and stable member lying radially outward. But doesn't the rising air in the updraft on the momentum surfaces so that as it gets to the outflow level, it's actually, the, the actual cyclonic flow goes away so that it becomes, you know, because it's expanding, yeah. it goes up. So, so it's not really cyclonic by the time well, it's now. Well, here's the curious thing. If I don't, I think what's happening is that locally, angular momentum is not conserved because of local pressure gradient forces. So as the air is entering the updraft, it accelerates. As it goes through the updraft, it further accelerates. Yeah, that's the odd thing. It accelerates in which direction? Um, in, in, <laughs> in the three cases that we've looked at that are pretty substantial uh, convective asymmetries, they originate on the, the east side of the low and um, in the northern hemisphere. Instead of the outflow jet going around, it just goes out and away into the... So well, that's what I'm jet. saying, because as it gets it's cyclonic at all levels, but as it gets high, it loses that cyclonic rotation because it's expanding. So it conserves potential vorticity. Wow. Well, potential vorticity actually is going down towards zero, right? Because, because the heating function goes away at a certain height. So the B, theta dot dz is uh, less than zero. So potential vorticity is getting smaller, and then the rotation stops as you get to the uh, as you get to the higher level, so it pretty much just flares out without mm -hmm. any rotation at all. Well, um, when these updrafts, all I can say is when these updrafts reach the UTLS, they, they're rapidly juxtaposing air moving at a different speed with local air that's, and it has an effect similar to a canoe paddle, is what I'm arguing. Maybe it's but, carrying the momentum of the whole storm rather than the cyclonic momentum. I think what happens in the outflow, after it ex there's acceleration within a convective complex, that mm -hmm. there's turbulent diffusion at all scales that, that are 
spreads out into the whole storm. And so you might maybe consider the accelerations in all these delta functions as, as being the storm acceleration. Uh, you know, Tim Duncan was one of the reviewers, and he's, net, he's a strong exponent of the axis symmetric theory of cyclone development. Um, similar things to what you were saying, but he, he, did, he did agree that there might be some interesting effects of the asymmetries. <clears throat> so uh, this just shows that the two ideas are pretty similar. How do you um, have a local acceleration in UTLS? Well, if you're bringing air up, W, D, B, Z, if you're bringing high polar flow air, cyclonic air upward, um, that'll cause a local acceleration. Um, and if you just take D by DX of it, then you get the tilting twisting term. So it's just one derivative that is the difference between these two concepts. Um, so yeah, vertical deduction of this tangential wind by the updraft corresponds to the tilting term and unifies the two perspectives in these figures that I'm showing. So there are really just two ways of looking at the same phenomenon. But if you don't like this approach with just talking about absolute vorticity in the vertical, um, wait to part three, which is in section six about the PV budget. Um, I'd like to point out that this is, this is a, a number that we want to keep in mind for the acceleration that we'll need to have. So um, it's about two hours to go up in a, an updraft, one or two hours. Um, everything has to happen on the time scale of um, the full blown thing within an hour or on the order of a meter per second per minute. So we can get at that if, it, if, if the updraft is two meter per second in the mid troposphere <coughs> and the upper troposphere shear is 30 meter per second, then, then we get on this one, we get one meter per second per minute. So, Try to keep that number in mind when we do the PV budget, because that's the acceleration we're going to assume for the localized stress by the equivalent canoe paddle of an updraft hitting the stratosphere. So here's our canoe paddle. Actually, if you think about this, this was just for a picture. I think that's a bent canoe paddle. So the boat's not over there, it's here. If you were going that way, then the canoe would paddle would be turned around if you were canoe as the so I think they were just going for a picture rather than, they're probably on the edge of a dock, right? Um, well, it's up to you whether you, you buy this. Maybe this is a bit mystical, but um, we'll just read this. The transition from troposphere to stratosphere is similar to that between water and air for a canoe paddle. A momentum impulse impinging on the interface will yield a local jet lift, hence a vorticity dipole. This point of view is related to human experience. I can appreciate momentum. You know, a wind gust when I was in Boulder last week actually knocked me over for the first time in my life. I got knocked over by a wind gust. I can, I have a feel for momentum and wind. Probably less so to, to the idea of tilting vorticity. It's just a little, it's another derivative and, and more spatially extensive knowledge is required to, to grasp that. Um, yeah, you only need to know the wind profile locally in order to to think about it this way. Um, it doesn't require knowledge of the synoptic scale structure and horizontal vorticity. All right, so that's uh, kind of some background of our of thinking, where we're thinking on this. And the first example is the cyclone Talus. And here it is at landfall. Um, this convective complex that we were studying went into the Kia Peninsula and rained a lot. Here's a, a picture of that. The low is about here. And it was a really big um, convective complex that lasted many hours. So if you look at the UW NMS simulation from an oblique view from the southeast, um, you can see here's a low pressure center. Uh, this blue isosurface, everywhere inside of it, the speed is greater than 34 meters per second. But everywhere outside of it is less. And we kept making these plots, and all of a sudden I realized it is what it says, that everywhere outside the speed is less. The speed, the horizontal speed of the air in the thunderstorm is faster than outside. It was a revelation. It was just like, really? <laughs> okay, I guess I have to accept that. Um, these are four hour back trajectories, so one, two, three hours. This is about an hour to intersect the PV dipole. Um, and you can see that this speed maximum is just injected by the updraft. The tilt of it is, is like this in physical space for those trajectories. 
like 85 degrees, see an angle. And then you can see kind of an uh, overshoot in substance, and this speed maximum, it's not shown here, joins with the subtropical westerly jet. And that happens in all three of these cases. So if you, if you take a meridional slice along this longitude through that updraft, then you can see that air in the lower troposphere was coming into it, pretty, pretty deep layer, maximum wind speed about here. Then here's some going up in a thunderstorm, here's some more going up in a thunderstorm, and then it gets ejected. So this, the vertical thickness of this, of the outflow layer, is, I believe, determining the depth of the PV dipoles. Because if it's caused by just momentum being injected into the base of the stratosphere, that's the jetlet. What is its distribution? That determines where the PV dipole is. Here's the vertical extent of the PV dipole. These are PV contours, so one, three, five, seven. Hmm. You have to go way up above out of this picture to get to a basic state stratosphere of 30 PV units. But this one is 30, that one's minus seven. Here is a updraft in blue. Um, you can see in these black contours formation of high PV by vortex stretching and then the loss of it by vortex compression. But then, wham, you hit the stratosphere and you impose a different horizontal flow locally, you'll get a dipole in vorticity. If you PV come... formed by vortex stretching? Sorry? <coughs> How is vortex stretching a source term for potential vorticity? Latent heating causes the vortex, the vertical. So it's d theta, <coughs> it's dq d theta. So it's, it's, it's not the vortex stretching, it's a theta dot. Theta dot varies yeah. in the vertical. There's yeah. a mid tropospheric maximum, and that causes vortex stretching. Yeah. So then, if we take a slice at 17 kilometers through here, you can see this PV dipole, and there's outflow this way that's blending in with this west of the jet. And so I want to show you a profile here in the updraft and then a profile here in the outflow layer, which emphasizes this transformation from ingesting high speed flow here, accelerating, and then it ejecting it in the uppermost layer. It's kind of like a reverse boulder windstorm where high wind speed air comes down. This is the opposite. So in, in, in the updraft region, you can see in blue, this really nice peak and vertical motion in, this, in, in the upper troposphere, about 300 hectopascals at three meters per second, which in the outflow layer is gone. This is so, so fairly neutral profile of vertical motion. And then um, in the updraft, we have this broad maximum of poleward flow, V, and in the outflow region, that's really small. Meridional flows are small in the troposphere, and it's all concentrated here about four kilometers centered on the triple house. Um, so we took a, a time sequence of meridional wind profiles, and you can see that um, there's a kind of momentum surge that goes up and through these conductive complexes, and, and it rises in time, overshoots, and then comes back down. And this period of time is about two hours. Um, so we'll show the same thing for Hurricane Edward with a little bit more detail. This is in 2014. A similar perspective, back trajectory show injection. Uh, um, the highest wind speeds are in inside the cloud and they're injected into the subtropical lower stratosphere. So here again, we see uh, broad meridional flow. That momentum is ingested in the updraft and spat out in a confined vertical layer in the ATLS. Here's a hint of gravity waves radiating from this updraft hitting the trouble pause. And if you look at an updraft profile here versus an outflow layer, in the next slide, it's pretty similar to before, where this is the updraft maximum at about seven kilometers altitude <coughs> with broad meridional flow. And then downstream of that, there's, there is no updraft, and you see that the, the poleward flow is confined to within a couple kilometers of up and above, above and below the treble pause. Uh, so this is a reminder to try a movie. So in the, in the first one, we'll emphasize contours of vertical motion, and there'll be an isosurface that's yellow, which is the speed isosurface, and then in orange will be the vertical motion isosurface at three meters per second. 
And then the second one that I'll show emphasizes uh, vectors in the meridional plane, and that's a little bit easier to see the pulses. So this is just to highlight that in a numerical model, um, you, it's, it's pretty complicated, this, this type of process. So this is a subtropical westerly jet. The updraft, the yellow and red coincide. The updraft and the speed maxima generally coincide. And there are several pulses. Well, by the updraft, you mean the eye wall? No, this is about, uh, this is a secondary partial, partial secondary eye wall. This is what is referred to in the literature. It's, it's out beyond the eye wall. This is 200 kilometers east of the, of the low. Um, so that way is north. Here's the top west of the jet. And uh, there's a speed maximum here. This is the first pulse of an updraft with high speed air in it. And it accelerates relative to what went into the storm. There's another, and there's another. We've started to look at uh, trying to validate these structures in the view of the MS by looking at drop signs. And this particular one does seem to, it was read about here, does seem to agree with this silver isosurface of uh, maximum polar flow in the model. I'm hoping to be able to do more work on of that type. Um, so here is uh, ETA. So this gives us a chance to put on our hat can we figure out the dynamics of the southern hemisphere? Um, and hurricanes go recurve this way in the southern hemisphere, of course. A lot of rainfall in Queensland with this one. So the low pressure center is here. This, this flow is 16.5 um, kilometers. And this red one is positive, so it's inertially unstable. And you can see there's a bias of outflow associated with this one relative to the, the negative or positive or the negative or stable member. This arrow is the upper tropospheric shear. So um, around the low and mid levels, the flow goes this way. But at upper levels, it should be anticyclonic, which is clockwise in the southern hemisphere there. Or this is the shear vector in the low. PV does lie to the left. That works. Hmm. That's the tilting perspective. How about the convective momentum transport perspective? Well, this jetlet is this way. Ah, that's just air that was transported up from the mid troposphere because that's cyclonically moving air. I kind of like that explanation as being a little bit simpler. Maybe in my the latter half of my career, I prefer simplification. Maybe that's all that's happened, but I, I prefer this perspective. Um, and so then, if you look at this cyclone from the northeast, um, air goes around this way. Here's the trajectories being inject, ingested into the updraft. Um, this is the speed isosurface, which again joins with the subtropical westerly jet. Um, here's the updraft, which if that way is toward the south pole, um, you ingest lower tro mid troposphere here, goes up and then out in the UTLS. And then again, we'll just complete this picture with here's the updraft and here's the outflow location. I think that was a known slide, I didn't change the D to the downstream to a O for outflow. Uh, so again, we have a really nice uh, mid-tropospheric uh, updraft maximum, in this case, five meter per second. Here's the broad uh, southward flow, forward flow, in D, and downstream of that, it's confined to the UTLS. And then again, you have um, this pulse moving through the convective system and then subsiding. All right, so a little time before the faculty meeting. Uh, what about that PV budget? Okay, so first of all, how can we account for the magnitude of these PV dipoles? They, they seem big, 20 PV units, my goodness. Well, 
Here's one PV unit is 10 to the minus 6 Kelvin's going to be squared per kilogram a second. And this factor, 1 over rho, this is 1 over <coughs> 1. Um, d theta to z, that's about 20 Kelvin per kilometer. That gives you 0.2. If you think of horizontal variations in the flow associated with these mesoscale PV dipoles, uh, dv dx, uh, delta v is about plus or minus 30 meter per second. Delta x may be 150 kilometers. Um, these relative vorticities are on the order of plus or minus 2f or bigger. So if you multiply those, you get 40 of these units. So it's not too hard, surprisingly. We um, would argue that the vertical motion does not penetrate very far into the stratosphere, which limits the upward extent of the PV dipole. And the vertical extent of the PV dipole is determined by the vertical extent of the outflow jet. Once I start thinking in those terms, then it made perfect sense to me that why the PV dipole is confined to where it is. It's where that little jetlet is. So your PV dipole is on a height surface? <coughs> well, I mean, they, they extend from this pressure level to this pressure level, from this theta level to this theta level, from this height to this height. But, uh, but I mean, if you you see a 40 millibar difference in PV on the height surface between the oh, I see. Um, 40 PVU, you can see. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, your model coordinate is Z, so these maps are in height coordinate. But if you did it on a, uh, an isotropic surface, it would be that big. It probably would be a lot less, because the isotropic surface itself is warped, which is why you see the PV on a height surface. Um, there, that, might, that might be right, but at a one altitude, I, haven't, I need to think about that more, but I think that's what it is. That's that's why you see folded trouble pauses. Well, it's like this. No, it, it, not exactly because and, and this this is actually uh, important. So let, let's say we have flow going over an updraft here. It goes up. That's negative theta anomaly. Down. That's positive theta anomaly. The orientation of the theta warping is this way. The PV dipole is at right angles to that. And so that that relationship can be used if you. I'm hoping to be able to do this to use satellite plot top temperatures and simple statistical relations to diagnose the PV dipole strength from satellite temperatures, assuming orthogonality of that pair. Um, so I'm, I was, I'm happy with this diagnosis of if you look at, at a mesoscale phenomenon, which has a Rossby number of about two, um, that at the tropopause with this large factor here, you, you can get PV dipoles of that magnitude. Okay. Now, for the <laughs> PV budget. Here we go. Um, so I turned this upside down just to make it look more like a stratosphere. Um, so here's the PV conservation equation. Uh, this one is the, uh, the tangential stress, so the curl of the stress. If you have a rotating annulus and you, you hit it on the side, you can spin it up. There are other processes that are causing these things. In this case, uh, well, sometimes people invoke, say, in, in the mesosphere, you might have a gravity wave drag on the periphery of a, of a anticyclone that could amplify it, for example. In this case, this isolated stress at Y, and just let's idealize things, so we're only talking about poleward motion, so there's an isolated stress like this. Forget about these for a minute. Let's assume some sort of you know Gaussian distribution of this. Therefore, there's a, a half width to it. There's a spatial scale associated with it. It's it's that spatial scale is linked to the transition from the updraft to the environment. How big is the updraft? Hmm. All right. So that's this term over here. If Q is on the order of one or two uh, k per day, the spatial gradients here. When I did back of envelope calculations, all seemed to be um, several orders of magnitude smaller than this one. And the reason is it just happened, this whole thing happens on a one hour time scale. At first there's nothing, then there's an updraft and it punches in. It's all like half an hour to an hour. Whereas a Q, that's, that's more of a diurnal or daily or multi-day time scale process. Okay, so then if you can impose a stress like that, well this air is gonna rotate that way and this air is gonna rotate that way. But 
what do we use for f, little big f sub y? What do we use? So it's the acceleration, meter per second squared. Ah, we had the constraint from previously of one meter per second per minute from an estimation of the vertical advection to account for the acceleration that happens locally when an updraft hits the lower stratosphere. How about uh, another point of view? This is u times v and the correlation, sorry, v times w. So this polar tilted updraft causes a pretty serious upward transport of polar momentum. And across five kilometers, we go from 80 meters square per second squared to, let's say, zero. So you can make a very coarse estimate of uh, the effect of this momentum flux convergence in the layer, which is like this. So you can maybe represent acceleration of the ambient air. The model doesn't know about ambient air versus cloud air. So you have to separately put on a hat that only humans can do and say, some of this air, we're going to label cloud air. And this air, we're going to label not cloud air. Models, right? but, so this is conceptual. Vertical momentum flux convergence can lead to an acceleration. Well, if we want Fy to be one meter per second per minute, which is what you get from d by dz of 80 meter per meter square per second squared over five kilometers, that's exactly what you get. And you put it into the equation, the first term on the right hand side, with a spatial variation of the jet of 100 kilometers. That's overestimating. The, the size of an updraft, uh, then you do get um, PV increasing at one PV per minute, which is quite adequate for creating these, these observed structures. All right, so uh, one last uh, topic, and um, I was really uncomfortable realizing, wow, speeds inside the, inside the thunderstorms are faster than the surroundings, and what does this mean? Um, until I started reading some more papers in the last five years, like I said, there's, there's a growing, might, one might say, consensus that this is the case. And so what I'm um, about to say is, I don't think it's controversial, it's just maybe a different, a slightly different perspective. Okay, so the question is, what is the role of asymmetries? And this is the landfall of Hurricane Michael, which, wow, there's a lot of clear properties of, of symmetry, but there are also really interesting departures from symmetry. And that's kind of a general rule of tropical cyclones. I used to think they were just like a, a disk of you know, like fairly uniform things, but I think that's really from the point of view of um, visible in the visible part of the spectrum, hurricanes tend to look that way. But in fact, they have a lot of asymmetries. There's Hurricane Bonnie, there's Hurricane Earl, different structures. And so, <laughs> And I know this, is, this might sound weird, but as a community, we don't consider density very much. We like to set it to be a constant, maybe include rho prime and abyssinesque approximation. Well, yeah, if you set density to be a constant everywhere, you can't have any motion, there's no general circulation. And I, I'm, you know, in recollection of how does the general circulation work? Well, first of all, you need differences in heating, and that can lead to differences in density. And then you can invoke Archimedes' principle, and you have vertical motions. That's the starting point. You don't start with an equilibrated geostrophic jet. <coughs> you start with vertical motions. And then, well, that means you have horizontal convergence and divergence patterns. So then you have divergent motions. That's the next thing conceptually. No rotational flow yet. Now, under rotation, once you have divergent <coughs> and convergent motions, you can start to get into geostrophic flows that are pretty substantial. And you might think that that's the prime thing that's happening, but really, underlying that, you have to invoke differences in heating and differences in density to achieve it. Hmm. So Greg has this interesting model variable of density. This is rho prime, and it's smallest here. So that kind of intuitively <laughs> says you're accelerating <laughs> down the density grid and then decelerating to here. Look at these positive perturbations, that's where there's an overshoot and subsidence. It's the resistance of that high density. I don't know, this is just a kind of an intuitive idea. Maybe density is important to consider in these, these things instead of, just because we don't measure density doesn't mean it's not important. How about that? You know, we measure pressure and temperature and humidity, but not density. Hmm. Maybe it, there could be something coming from that point of view. So, I don't know what you think about this idea. Thermodynamic acceleration. I'm, I'm thinking this kind of encompasses both 
the <coughs> primary axisymmetric <coughs> theories and also the possible contributions from local convective elements. So um, density perturbations determine vertical motion. Here's, here's the part of the Boussinesque approximation. You need to go prime in order to have any <coughs> vertical motions or any general circulation that's not zero. Um, and, and then think, if you think about this, the rate of change of the vertically integrated density is equal to the rate of change in sea level pressure. That's when it way to describe deepening. The less mass you have, the lower the density in the column, the lower the sea level pressure. Um, divergence aloft accompanies the fall in the central pressure. That can happen at the tops of thunderstorm complexes, not just the hurricane as a whole. Um, if you have divergence, if you have a local pressure gradient force, you can accelerate uh, during ingestion of warm, moist air. And so, in general, we could say that there's a synergistic feedback between latent heat release, a vertical and horizontal acceleration, and maybe this could be called thermodynamic acceleration. Um, I'm aware that uh, throughout my career that people who really are hurricane experts argue vigorously about these theories, and I don't want to get tangled up in it. I'm just kind of mm, sort of naively saying, what about this kind of, just this general idea? Is density an important way to think about it? Um, so, it, so this process can occur as, as part of the storm as a whole or locally is, is the point. So if you look at the equations of motion, you have a local pressure gradient force. That can cause local accelerations, local increases in momentum. So um, I guess I realized that in talking with Francis Bretherton once about the zonally symmetric angular momentum is that no, if you have a DPDX somewhere, you can definitely accelerate the flow of weight. There's no rule against it. <clears throat> Since latent heat release is concentrated in a convective complex, in these studies, inward and upward acceleration will be stronger there, so that the air in the updraft will have higher horizontal speed. How else would this happen? I don't know, than the surrounding air. The cyclonic momentum in the convective complex would then be transported and mixed throughout the storm, tending to strengthen the tropical cyclone as a whole. So this, I guess this is the idea that the United States is the sum of people rather than, I don't know what the opposite would be. And then if you think about the Rossby number, this says something a little bit challenging to the aficionados of axisymmetric theory because you wouldn't expect it to be in thermal wind balance if the Rossby number is bigger than one. Hmm. Uh, just a, an overview, a summary of this physical picture. These things often break out over here. We hope to do a statistical study divided by quadrant and, 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 life, and, and phase of life cycle for thunderstorm and also pro hurricanes and also proximity to the subtropical muscular jet. But in these three cases, we have an ingestion of air that accelerates in this polar tilting updraft hits the stratosphere, creates this PV dipole, which is a signature of this whole vigorous thing ha happening. And then there's this outflow jet between the PV dipole that sometimes joins with the subtropical western jet. So, some conclusions. The first one I still can't quite get over. The horizontal speeds within convective complexes exceed that of their environment. Hmm. And then a description of their morphology. A spatially continuous speed maximum is observed to travel from Upstream in the lower troposphere, accelerating in the tilted updraft and into the outflow jet, transporting constituents and momentum in the sub, into the subtropical stratosphere. So then this new conductive momentum transport hypothesis does predict the vertical extent and orientation of the PV dipole jetlets. It's just the difference in momentum. Uh, so the vortex tilting theory can't do that. Can't do that. Um, and then in general, in tropical cyclones, cyclonic momentum is simply in the mid-troposphere is transported upward in the updraft and becomes a mesoscale outflow jet directed in the same sense, which is opposite to the ambient flow. Um, and then as far as the PV budget, the curl of the net viscous force associated with the updraft and outflow jet can create large PV anomalies in the UTLS in less than an hour. And finally, um, there seems to be an emerging issue of what can local thunderstorms do Local thermodynamic acceleration occurs within the updrafts, and local azimuthal accelerations probably contribute to a strengthening of the tropical cyclone. Maybe they don't. Maybe in some macroscopic configuration, some convective acceleration here may act to inhibit growth elsewhere and not cause the storm to grow. So 
I don't pretend to understand the details of tropical cyclones, which are uh, clearly rich in nature and, and very hard to predict when they amplify and where they'll go. But convective asymmetries are probably part of the problem for determining that. So thanks for listening. Very interesting, Matt. I'm intrigued by what you might think about extending the notion of an isolated updraft to a linear updraft, manifested as a spiral rain band. And mm -hmm. are you producing, are you shedding negative PV mm -hmm. radially mm -hmm. over much greater distances, much more rapidly, oh, because you have linear so, bands of, so of you, convective you activity? A, like a, a, a long jet or a spiral shaped jet, then you'll have uh, two. Vorticity stripes. Yeah, right. Side. Strips okay. of positive and, and negative vorticity or positive and negative PV. I hadn't PV. thought about that. I thought about the inner eye wall. And if you have, um, it's sort of like, where is wave number one energy? It's everywhere. If you have an inner eye wall and, and there are convective elements everywhere, you won't see any PV dipoles. But um, that one, where you have a start and an end, maybe you'll have strips. Long on strips. And, and maybe the strips accelerate the process by which the cyclone sheds all the negative PV and concentrates the positive mm. on the inside. Mm. Mm. So anyway, something that occurs to me. It's really interesting. I will think about that. Thanks. Well, time to set up for a faculty meeting. <coughs> Oh, wait, can I have one more question? Sure. If you go to the mid latitudes where the boundary layer can be convectively unstable, not likely in the tropics, then you can have probably stronger negative PV pieces of the dipole. Isn't that right? Because the air gets up to 500, 400 nullbars, yeah. and the stratification's so, positive, and you've got to exchange your negative PV for your for negative vorticity. Yeah, I guess by talking only about um, UTLS PV dipoles, the dominant process seems to be that isolated stress. But throughout the troposphere, like you're saying, other people were saying, there's um, the vertical distribution of latent heating can give rise to vortex stretching or compression. And depending on where the updraft is, where the environmental horizontal vorticity is, and all those things, you can get different combinations. So if you, if you look at PV dipoles, you can find them in, in the mid-troposphere. All you have to have is a difference in wind speed in the updraft compared to its environment. Um, but I think there's a, certainly a richness to explore if you include both ideas, mm -hmm. tilting, twisting, or local convective momentum transport, plus the diabetic heating pattern. Which is yeah, redistribution of the PV or moist yeah. PV. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I guess I don't have any more. Thank you. Any other? Questions or comments? Well, <clears throat> thank you for listening. All right, thanks, man.